Morning. Make sure my alarm is on so I don't keep y'all to two o'clock. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see you today. Good to be here at Fun Day again. Sunday, Fun Day, all the same, right? Yes. How'd you get up there? <laughs> Revival days are coming. You know, some say we don't do that anymore, but we are. Amen. And we're not going to do it. We're going to do it right and have a great time in the Lord. We're going to see God do some great things in our midst. I hope you're in, looking forward to next Sunday as Brother Peasley arrives here. And he'll start with our men at our men's retreat over the weekend. Man, it's just going to be a phenomenal time. I, I talk with him. He's in Ardmore, Oklahoma, doing a revival starting today there. And so I said, well, make sure you get revived and come here. <laughs> so Thursday evening, we start our men's retreat with, with Brother Peasley and then go right on into Sunday morning. And so... It's just going to be great. Just a few days. I know we're living in that hustle, bustle, crazy world, you know, of activities. But it, there, there are times in our life when I think it is very important for us to just set it aside and say, hey, I need to get my spiritual batteries charged. You know, I need to take some time with the Lord and give God this opportunity to work in my heart and life. So just set aside Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, for, for the Lord. Uh, Sunday night, uh, there won't be a service here. Lift groups are doing prayer meetings. Some are coming over to the, to the revival itself. We welcome you to do that. But everybody that can come on over there for Sunday night service. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, we'll be doing here at this campus. It's just going to be a great time. I don't know when the last time you actually attended a revival was. I bet it's probably been a while. Maybe for some of us it's the last time we had one. But uh, they're always a, a great time of the Lord. We've really... Uh, done everything we can to make it just right for you. In fact, meals are being prepared each night for those who may kind of work late or just want to come fellowship with folks. Uh, those, I know they made the announcement about the inserts in your bulletin. If they haven't, they will. There's that little blue insert. Take the time to fill that out and put it in the offering receptacle if you're going to be eating each night with us or even one or two nights so we'll know. I, I think they even put the menu on there. So uh, what a great church. Amen. My, my little weather changer here. There it goes. We're in a series of messages called Higher. In fact, I stepped out of the pulpit. I even told this to somebody, but coming into the church uh, last Sunday, I turned to Kathy and said, you know, I, man, if I wasn't a member here, I'd join. Amen. I really would. I mean, this is the greatest church around. I mean, we, we have our faults and problems like all do, but you know, it just doesn't get much better. Yeah, did you notice this morning? I bet somebody greeted you on the way in. Some of you probably had somebody even offer to park your car for you. Some of you helped you with children, get your kids in. Did, was somebody at the door be greeting you today? I, mean, yeah. I, I, bet, now, I bet there was somebody inside the door even greeting you. We had somebody out in the park. Where are you getting much friendlier than that? You know? you, you, I bet when you got in here, the lights were already on. <laughs> were they? Yeah. Temperatures right for everybody to be comfortable today? Yeah. You know, somebody got here and fixed all that up for us. Somebody turned the, got here for everybody else, turned the lights on. Music was great. Wasn't that great worship service today? I mean, Crystal's sick. But we survived, all right? But those guys got up here like early and did all that. That's pretty cool. I come in, I'm enjoying it, I'm blessed by it. You know, I come in, there's light. Hey, it's, it's warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Y'all notice that or not? Somebody set all those thermostats. I, I bet if you had a baby, somebody showed you where the nursery was, they should have helped you get there if they didn't shame on them, all right? You know, I, I noticed that, you know, they picked the baby, they took them and put them in that little room back there. And you probably gave them some diapers because that happens. Right? <laughs> and, they, you know, they're probably back there, you know, at least they should be, wiping those nasty little things off, you know, and cleaning all that mess up as, as nice as it smells and everything. Somebody's doing that for you. You can't beat that deal, can you? And if you have children, the problem in the children's ministry, not they're down here today, the last Sunday, but they're down here with you. But Sunday, after, except for the last Sunday, they're upstairs. And, man, we got people that are ministering to them and taking care of them and watching over them. And you get to come in here and sit down and... Stand up and worship and sit down and get preached. Hey, at the seats, how are the chairs? They are comfortable. Aren't these chairs the greatest, all right? They're not comfortable. If they're not comfortable enough, you know, give me some money, I'll get you another one. I mean, we're here to please, amen? I mean, it's really great. Uh, you know, when you leave today, when everything's said, then somebody else is going to lock the building up for you. Lights, lots of lights and video. Somebody paid for all that. Aren't you glad they did? It's kind of nice. I get to see myself for once in a while. I say, well, let me fix that right there. <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? Just, just, just it's, it's, it's amazing all the things that go into a, to a service, and most people never even notice it. 
They never take it, never pay much attention to it, but everything's provided, bills are being paid. Every month we get this giant electric bill. I mean, it's, it's magnormous. That's a good word, right? I can't, you, you figure it out. It's just a massive electrical bill. And it, somebody paid that. They got a big pantry up there just stuffed full of food for people who have food needs. We got a clothes pantry for people who need clothes. Somebody, somebody comes up here every week and takes care of all that stuff. They lay that all out for you and just take care of it. I, I, you know, some of you got here early, you've probably got a cup of coffee. What'd that cost you? I just go down two blocks of Starbucks, it'll hit you for five or six bucks, not counting tax. <laughs> and they won't say, praise the Lord. <laughs> but here you just come in, push that little thing. Somebody made some coffee, praise the Lord. Water bottles are out there. There's to clean toilets. Pray, I went in there just a while ago myself. Oh, this place is clean. Do a good job, all right? And I went over, and really nice, I was washing my hands, and I rinsed over to get paper towels, put my hands in front of this little machine, and it just dispensed them for me. Y'all been in there and seen that? That's amazing. That's probably the stuff they shouldn't have had when I was growing up, because I emptied the paper towel dispenser as a kid, you know. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. I'll catch you. I'll rip your head off. That's what happened to me when I got caught doing stuff like that. But you know what I mean? That's pretty cool. Somebody had to open that thing up, order that paper, load it up in there. And those things weigh a ton. Stick it up in there, make sure it's feeding right, do all the stuff, change the batteries in it so you could walk up there and go, Pfft. you can't beat that. It's a good deal, isn't it? How many of y'all got some bulletins when you came in? Did y'all get one of those? Sometimes it's just way too much in there. But they're nice. Did you see how pretty it was? Got Cecil Peasley's picture on the front. I didn't even put my picture on the front of the bulletin. We don't want to scare everybody off. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You probably just left it in your Bible. You open that thing up, and look, not while I'm preaching, but later. There's inserts in there and stuff about classes in there. There's all kinds of information about children in there. He even talks about the dual services and all that we do. This place, they, this church, there are people in this church who literally put money in a box every week and provide all this for us. They pay the preachers. They're, they're, you can come to this place. If you're having trouble with your family, your needs, your children, your husband, you can, come, you can get free Free, F-R-E-E, -E, free counseling. Amen. You take that down to the business office down there, they're going to charge you $75 a minimum an hour. That's just to register. And then if you're a new customer, you're going to have to pay the new customer registration. What am I saying? Everything that happens here, as beautiful as it happens, is because somebody's doing something for God. Somebody's taking some extra time. Somebody's spending some money. Somebody's doing some service. Somebody's, somebody's working hard. Somebody cares. Somebody's committing to other people's lives. You know, that's, that's the heartbeat of what makes church, church. Is it, it's the body of Christ functioning the way it's supposed to function so that everything is being taken care of and everything is being done orderly and everything is being done for the glory of God. Now, as we've got in, in, into this series on hire each week, We've talked about a lot of different elements of, of what it means to, to go higher with the Lord. And we, this is the fifth in the sermon series. This message title is very simple today, just faithful. Faithful. Aren't you glad that there all around you are some faithful people? So many things that we just take for granted. So many things we just used to seeing and used that we just take for granted. But somebody's being faithful. Faithful to worship, faithful to practice, faithful to clean, faithful to, to serve, faithful to commit, faithful to give, faithful people. Each, each of these sermon series, I've started off with a, with a list of questions, and we've ended with the list of questions, and I want you to look at them one more time. Now, we're five weeks down the road from, from this ser in this sermon series. This is the fifth in the series, and every one, we've asked these questions twice, first the sermon, end of the sermon, you know, where am I in my walk of faith? Now, question one is pretty simple. We're, we can, if we'll take the time and do kind of an evaluation, just go, where am I? Well, hopefully, if you've been here for each service, you're not back where you were at week one. Even if it's a baby step, I hope you're not where you were, all right? If I, if I knew where I was, I'm, I'm moving forward. I don't care where you are, how spiritual you think you are, you can still go further. You can still reach higher. You can still go deeper, amen? You can still go down the road some more with Christ. So where am I? And then, you know, where, where am I headed? If I got my goals right and my focus right, not just in the long term, I'm headed to heaven, but what's God got for my life right now? Am I headed that direction? 
where's God using me? What's God's purpose for my life? And, and if I'm going that direction, you know, if I'm not going that direction, I, I need to check, what's my problem? That's where a lot of people don't like to go to. <laughs> what's my problem? Now, some of you could quickly tell me my problem, but I'm talking about you answering that for yourself. What's your problem, all right? What's my problem, all right? And then if I've got this hindrance and I'm not, and now that I've discovered it, what, what do I need to do to take the next step to get past that and get beyond that? So hopefully in week five to week one, you've seen some changes in your life. If not, you're just being lazy spiritually and you need to make some adjustments in your life. You need to do what God's calling you to do. You need to get serious about your commitment to Christ, serious about your call of, that God has upon your life. Now, Paul writes the Corinthian church, and if you like all of his letters when he writes the church, they're very evaluative, if that's a word, all right? And he calls them into a place that you need to guys to check and see where you are. In fact, he very frankly tells them what he's seen in their midst or what they're experiencing and where they need to go. In fact, that's pretty much the Bible. And is it not almost every book of the Bible, chapter of the Bible, gets us to, to evaluate where we are, where we're headed, what God wants in our life, what's wrong in our life, and make the adjustments as to how we can deal with that. As he gets into the letter to the Corinthians, and this is a, a series of sermons we probably ought to do in, in, in the future, 1 Corinthians, because it's just great, all right? But it, he begins and he ends it with this whole context of, you know, where you are, what are you doing about it? Let's move forward and let's be faithful. So as he gets into the chapter 3, remember it's not chapters and verses, it's originally just a letter. It's broken down for reference sake. But in King James he says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3, Brethren, could not speak to you as under spiritual. This is evaluation he's given them. I had to talk to you as carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, and neither yet now are you able. In other words, you're not where you should be. You're, you, you were still carnal, yet carnal, for where is there's among you? There's envy and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and are you not walking like men, like mere men? All right. Now, if you notice in verse 1, he uses this word carnal. In verse 3, he uses the word carnal again. That's really in the Greek language two different words translated in the English carnal, carnal in the, in the King James. All right. It's the word sarkinos and the word sarkikos. And they're really very similar words, but they, 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 they literally mean fleshly or carnal, you know. Uh, but we lose the context of what those words actually are saying to us in our English language. New American Standard, I believe, does a little bit better translation when it says, Brethren, I couldn't speak to you unto spiritual men, but as unto men of flesh, carnal, as to babes in Christ. The word for the Greek word there is it's somebody that's just an infant. You, you've been saved. Here's what happens. You're an infant. So what do you need to do as an infant? You need to grow. But he goes on to say, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able yet to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able. For you're still, there's the word carnal. You're still carnal. You're still fleshly. All right? You're still fleshly. Fleshly is an adjective, all right? Uh, I mean, an adverb describes what they are. It, it ends with an L-Y. It kind of says, this is, you're, still, you're still babies. But in the Greek language with the sarkinos and the sarkikos, it breaks down like this. Baby, and it almost could be like dwarfed. You should be growing, but you haven't. It was the natural process for you to grow, but the natural process didn't function in the way that it was supposed to in your spiritual life. So you're not growing in Christ. You've had opportunity to grow. There's been time for growth. You've had the, the, uh, the teaching to grow, but you, haven't, you didn't receive the milk, so I can't give you the meat because you're not where you should be. You know, It's like you're, you're a 40-year-old baby. You kind of got what this means, uh-huh. Just means if you agree with me, we'll, we'll move a little faster. You see, you, you, you've had the opportunity, but yet you haven't taken the opportunity. Therefore, you're living like natural men. You're living like material men. You should be. He said, you're even, you're even, and he goes, and I'm talking about, you know, I'm a Paul, a Papa, a Cephas. You know, he, he said, you even had the, you like fan clubs. You started fan clubs. Of which preacher you like the best? You know, well, I like Brother Paul, or I like Brother Peter, or, you know, Brother, Brother, you know. And, and he said, it's just, it's just carnal. He said, it's just stupid. It's like natural people act. You know? We don't have personality pop favorites in the preaching world. We're all, he says, servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of the gospel. Nobody's any better than anybody else. Quit having fan clubs. Well, I just appreciate the way Brother Joe preaches. No, I just kind of like Brother Strickland's teaching better. You know? And he says, quit that. Come on. He said, this is ridiculous. He said, we're all, and he's talking about all, not just the leaders and the teachers, but he said the church, we're all servants of Christ. 
He said, we're all building on that chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. We're all there for him and for his glory. It's not about personalities and it's not about people. And he goes through and he starts talking about how we're co-workers in the kingdom of God. We're co-workers in God's vineyard. We're, 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 we're in service together for the king. It's like we talked about this morning coming in and all these things are working and happening all at once because people are faithfully serving and, and honoring the Lord with their gifts, their time, their treasure, their talents. They're doing something for God. We are all builders and we all should be builders. He even talks about the materials as you follow through, building on the foundation, make sure that our works are righteous works. You know, we're, we're not being carnal. We're not, it's not wood, hay and stubble. We're honoring the Lord with our lips, our lives, our time, our treasures. We're just honoring God. He said, but we're all building on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gets into chapter four as you follow this thing through. And, and he kind of gets to what I would call the, the core of the thought here. This morning's message as well as this whole letter that he's talking to them. He says this in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. King James and ESV says that they be found faithful. Same word. The most important thing about each of our lives, he's saying, is that we be found faithful. There ought to be this banner over the life of every Christian, every child of God that says, faithful. Let them be found faithful. Get away from our carnality, get away from our living and walking like people and regular men do, because we're not regular people. We're, we're, we belong to the family of God. We, we are the children of God. And what is required of us as children we're faithful workers, we're faithful stewards, we're, we're faithful to what God's called us to do. In fact, he spends a lot of time in this letter dealing with the body dynamics of everybody's different responsibilities and different gifts within the body of Christ. And he sorts out a lot of those issues they were having over it. And he gets down to the line, you're looking at 11 and 12 and 13, where he's talking about, let's get busy being what God's called us to be. He starts later dealing with the resurrection and all those glorious things to come. But he comes back to the end of the letter and he talks about their responsibilities. He says, I want you to take notice of people. He even talks about, I think in chapter 16, he talks about, take note of Stephanus. If King James puts it like this. He has addicted, he and his family have addicted themselves to the ministry. I love that. You want an addiction? Get it to the ministry. Get it. I, hey, I, I love serving God. God get, got to get me another hit of serving Jesus. Got to get me another, another shot of talking about Christ, of serving God for his glory. Letting God be in me what he, what he desires to do. I think what we failed the church so much in the culture that we live in is people come to church and, and they, that, that's it for them. They, they don't realize that they're supposed to be part of church. That they're active in church, that they're a vital, gifted, unique part of what God's doing within the whole context of, of a body. You know that I do seminars and stuff like that. A lot of times what I teach pastors, especially what I've been doing in recent years, in dealing with pastors and teaching them as a pastor and encouraging them in their ministries, one of the things I do is that you've got to let your people know in your fellowship what the expectations are. As members. When I read the Bible, there are some very clear expectations that God has for me as his child. When I read those passages and scriptures and get into the epistles where it talks about the local church body and I get serious about those, those places in the Bible and I realize that's you, that's me, I, I, then I get focused on the fact that, hey, there's some serious expectations that God has for me in the body of Christ. In fact, you know, we teach that to pastors as we, what, what we believe the Bible teaches those expectations are. Uh, most churches that are doing something for the glory of God are very clear on what those should be. Uh, I'm, I'll play a little quote from Anthony Evans, Evans later on, but one thing about, you know, his church is it's every member has a ministry. In fact, you're not even considered a member of the church or an alternative church where Dr. Evans pastors if you don't have and are not involved in a ministry. You don't get to church vote. You don't get to church be considered a church member. You know, you, you just like the visitors and the guests. It's not your church yet. You can't claim it as your church until you have a ministry in that church. There's a church called Lake Avenue Baptist Church out of Pasadena, California. I read it. They, they have this document they have. They hand out, and in the document, there's seven expectations and three priorities in which you sign that you're expected to fulfill. Seven expectations. Skyline Westland, Westland Church out in California, they, they have a deal. It's, it's, there's five things. They say, if you're going to be a member of this church, here, here it is, very clearly. First one, give up your rights. Servant. You become a servant. 
Give up your rights. Second thing they tell you, pay up your tithe. Obedience, stewardship, responsibility. The third thing on this is pick up your ministry. You're part of a team. It doesn't happen by individual persons. It happens by the team of people serving Christ as the body of Christ. The fourth thing that you're required to cheer up your brothers. Encourage one another. Consistently be encouraging. Quit talking about it, people behind the back. Don't make references to how they dress. Just encourage one another. Number five, back up your pastor. Be loyal to the body of Christ. Now, at our church, some of you just got through 101, you know, have just been through the class, and you know what we're talking about because at the end of our 101 class, we make it very clear, don't we? We share our structure, our strategy, and all that in the class. And at the end of the class, we talk about, if you're a member, here are the expectations of you as a member. You say, well, I don't remember that. Go back and open your workbook again. We went over it. In fact, it looks like this. When you, when you open up the page and look, at it, there's this comment that says, what's expected of you in our 101 class? And it's, it's, there's this statement. It says, having received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and being in agreement with believers' fellowship statements, strategy, and structure, which we just went over in the class, I now feel led by the Holy Spirit to unite with Believer's Fellowship family. And in doing so, I commit myself to God and to the other members to do the following. And we list just four. We don't have five or seven like the others. We've, we've compacted it, all right? Down to four. One is this. I will protect the unity of my church. How do I do that? I act in love towards the other members. I don't gossip about people. I follow the leadership that, Lord, that God's given me in my life. All right. Number two in the class is I will share the responsibility of my church. How do I do that? By pay, praying for its growth, by inviting the lost and the unchurched to attend, and by warmly welcoming those who visit. In other words, if you're a member of this church, when it comes time to welcome and greet our guests, you are backslidden if you stay right where you're standing. Amen. You have to get out and reach out and love on somebody, especially our guests. Amen. So we welcome those who visit our fellowship. The third thing in the class we cover is I'll serve the ministry of my church by discovering my gifts and talents, by being equipped to serve by my pastors, and by developing a servant's heart. This is my commitment. The fourth, I'll support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully. That just causes a lot of problems for some people right there. By living a godly life, by giving regularly. Now that's, that's pretty simple, is it not? So if you've been through the 101 class, you know what the expectations are. But the bottom line, the key word there, we're just going to be faithful to what God's called us to do. God put me here, I'm going to, I'm going to blossom here. Amen. God planted me here, I'm going, to, I'm going to be fruitful here. I'm going to be faithful to whatever God has called me to do. And there's far too many people sitting in churches today who just kind of coming in, you know, and, and just sitting down, you know, what the deal's saying, you know, we get all I can, can all I get, you know. That, that, that's kind of what I get. I'm going to get what I can get out of it. Again, it's just for me. And it's, the church is about me. And church is about my spirituality. And church is about my walk. And church is about my growth. And church is about my world. And, you know, hang everybody else as long as I'm happy. You know, you come into church, perhaps the temperature isn't where it should be. I can't believe the thermostat say right. Somebody actually sings a wrong note. Oh, did you hear that? Sermon pastor says something like the Apostle Paul instead of James. But the quote was wrong. Can't, He's preaching the word of God. He'll at least get it right. <laughs> you know, we just, just miss the mark completely. We miss this idea that, hey, this is our church. This is what God has called us to, and we're going to charge hell. You know, hand out the water pistols. Let's go. I'm ready to be used by God. I'm ready to do something for the glory of God. And not be looking for everybody else to do everything for me. These are expectations. They're really just the Christian life within the body of Christ in action. And it's what God has called us to be. Now, characteristics of that should be obvious within our life. Let me give you about eight things this morning, very quickly. Eight things to evaluate yourself by. We talked about this evaluation. Where am I? I really want us to honestly look at this. Where am I in regard? And we should do this, by the way. Why? Because we're going to stand before God one day. There's the Bema seat. The Bible says that every Christian will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne of judgment for the lost. The, the judgment seat of Christ. Where we will give an account. We will give an account. Boy, everybody's getting up and moving around all of a sudden. I get, this is getting too personal? Hey. <laughs> 
We're going to give an account to God of, of where we are, what we do with our lives. And so I know I'm going to do that. So I, I, I realize that one day people stand for God. I'm next in line. I want to evaluate myself. I want to see where I am and what's going on in my spiritual life. So let's just walk through these eight and, and look and see where you are in regard to each one of these. I think there's certain characteristics that will shine out of our life. One is we're going to have right values. A faithful person is a person who realizes that in life it is extremely important that I'm living by the right set of principles and by the right standards. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, you are living like natural men. You're not living by the right principles. You don't have the right set of standards. Uh, we, can, we can live in this world, all right, and live by the standards. We're, we're all right with everybody in the world. But those aren't God's standards. God says, my ways are not your ways. My ways, we read that scripture, are higher. So what do we need? We need to get higher. We need to uh, uh, embrace and adopt biblical standards. Where, where are they? They're all through the word of God. And his ways are not the ways of man. So I want to come to this place in my life and say, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to embrace what God's standards are and his principles. Therefore, I'm going to be a faithful person. I'm going to be a faithful husband. I'm going to be a faithful individual. I'm going to invest my life properly according to God's will. Remember the sermon a couple weeks ago on the talents? How that some buried the talents, some invested the talents. I don't want to be the person who buries. I want to be the person who uses and invests what God's given me in my life. My personality, my gifts, my talents. We're all unique and we're all to invest all that we are for the glory of God. Most people are not in that category. Many people today are not interested in what does God really want? How can I use my life best for the kingdom of God? How can I use my life best to bring glory to God and bear fruit for the glory of God? It's all about how much can I make? What can I get out of this? What can you give me? I mean, Proverbs 28, 20 gives you a little contrast. It says this, a faithful man will be richly blessed. Say it again. A faithful man will be richly blessed. The rest of it says, but one eager to get riches will not go unpunished. Now, it's not talking about making a living. It's talking about, I live to get rich. I live for the material. I live to get more. The Bible teaches us very clearly, you know, that, that we, can, we, we have responsibilities with our funds, with our money. You know, we have responsibilities to our family, we have responsibilities to the kingdom, we have responsibilities in our life. So he's just saying, hey, you know, you need to get your, 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 your priorities straight. But how often is it in Scripture that really you see that kind of comparison between money and faithfulness? Man can't serve God and money. Is that what the Bible says? Do you think God just kind of pulled those comparisons out of the air? <laughs> no, because he knows the driving force of most people's life is materialism. We lust for things. We want things. We want more things. We say, I don't want everything. I just want more. You know, and this is kind of what drives so many. There's nothing wrong with having, but we have so that we can invest with God and so that we can use what God gives us for his glory so that we can honor God with what he's given us. So we get these principles right, it's amazing how it affects us, you know, in, 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 in not just in, in, in our time and our, our talents, but even within the context of what he has given us. This is like people who say, you know, well, I don't have money to, to put in ministry. Then you're not faithfully investing. You don't understand biblical standards. Well, I don't have time for, for serving church. And, I, you know, I, I don't have time to be in church faithfully. I got other stuff I like to do and want to do. So, you know, my Sundays are my Sundays. No, they're not if you're a Christian. Your Sundays are God's Sundays. So I have to get up and say, what do you want to do today, God? I have to do that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday also. Amen? My life belongs to him. Your life belongs to him. So will I be faithful? And what counts, folks, is not just me. It's others. What can I do for the glory of God? So, number one, uh, if I want to stand for the Lord, do I, do I have right values and standards? Number two, uh, uh, I invest in other people. In fact, I mean, when you even think about the word faithful, you, you can't be faithful and, and be isolated, can you? Faithful husband has a wife. <laughs> that he's faithful. faithful father has children. He's faithful to a faithful person has a God he has to be responsible for. So the whole idea of faithfulness has to do with relationships, doesn't it? It's, it's an expression that I'll be honorable and have integrity in my, my obligations and my relationships that, that, I'm, that I'm carrying about in my life. So you know, I can't be really even faithful without other people. And I think when I stand before the judgment seat, I'm going to have to give that honest answer. Did I really care about other people? 
Or was it just about me and my world and making sure that, you know, the earth rotated on its axis just for me? You know, there's this great passage that, uh, you know, that we should all desire to, that if we were living in the time that was written, that our name would be there. And it's the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to the church in, in, in the book of Philippians. And in chapter 2, he's talking about someone who he trusts and who's faithful. Listen to what he says. Chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 20 through 22. I have no one like Timothy who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. That's powerful. Paul's surrounded by a lot of people. We've read a lot of their names, haven't we? In the study, we've talked about a lot of these people. Yeah, but you know what it comes down to really finding somebody who's really caring about other people and taking interest in your welfare? This guy's the guy, Timothy. Goes on to say, everyone looks out for their own interest and not those of Jesus. But Timothy has proved himself. He served with me in the work of the gospel. Now, and I praise the Lord God gave me a Timothy like that here at church, all right? We have a Timothy Strickland, praise the Lord. So I have this Timothy, you know, and... and this scripture, and I'm not trying to get your head puffed up. You get so stuffed up now you can't breathe anyway. But I don't have anybody like Timothy who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Amen. He cares about you. How often do I walk by Tim's office and he's picking up the phone calling somebody that he knows has a need? Was it on his to-do list that I gave him? No. He just has it. I don't have to put it on his list. Amen. He does it. How many of us... Would, I, mean, I mean, this, is the, this book's going to go on forever and ever. Wouldn't you like to have your name put there? <laughs> I don't know anybody like Job. This is the Apostle Paul who's surrounded by a lot of Christians. I don't know anybody like that. And they serve with me in the work of That ought to be every desire of every Christian that we can have that kind of testimony of faithfulness. Now, if you understand faithfulness, it always boils down to a choice, does it not? Guess what? I'm going to be faithful to the revival next week. Okay. What's that mean? I'm going to have to make some choices. What's on TV? It's not one of them. What my March Madness hit? It's not one of them. You know, what's going on at the lake? It's not one of them. You know, when, when I have this ring on my hand over here. Some of y'all carry that on your left hand. That's just, that's a symbol of what? Faithfulness. When I put the ring on my Jeff said her, I'll be faithful. You only, no other women. None were lining up, by the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, see, but that's it. But th that's the importance of faith. The third element of faithfulness is your testimony. You understand if you're a faithful person, your testimony and your integrity is more important than anything else. In other words, a mark of faithfulness is the testimony. Not to have here, because we can all fool one another. But it's the old Abraham League thing. You can't fool everybody all the time thing. What kind of faithful testimony do I have before the world? Before strangers, before people that, don't, that may not know me as well as you know me. In fact, when we, we, we read the Bible about selecting pastors and elders, this is one of the, the, the deals under elders and pastors. It says they must have a good reputation without, outside the fellowship with lost people. Because anybody can come in here at church and do the thing. But it's another thing when you're out on the streets doing your other thing. He said, you, you, that's, not, that's not faithfulness. That's, that's a phony faithfulness. He said, so, you know, your, your, your integrity is important. Daniel's a great picture of this in the Bible, right? The, Daniel, remember the story about Daniel and how he was hated by the Chaldeans? They hated him because he's advancing. God's blessing him in the kingdom because he's a faithful man. And what, I mean, what of you here that has the responsibility for hiring people, you, you don't want to see on their resume, unfaithful. They'll show up sometimes, won't show up sometimes. They'll show up, but they show up late. You know, that's not faithfulness. They're not committed. You, know, you don't want to hire somebody like that. You want to hire somebody. Here's what it says in Daniel. Let me read it from the Living Bible. It's, it's, it's really interesting twist on it. In, in chapter 6, verse 4, it says, The Chaldeans were jealous, and they began searching for some fault in the way of Daniel was handling his affairs so they could complain to the king about him. But they couldn't find anything to criticize. He was faithful and honest, and he didn't make mistakes. That's the testimony we need. And if we're going to, have to be faithful to the Lord, then that means I'll be faithful to the Lord wherever I am. I, 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 I'm responsible for the, my testimony is important. Integrity is important to me. 
The fourth element of being a faithful person is you keep your word, all right? Proverbs 25 says, like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of gifts that he does not give. We, we, we live in Texas, all right? We know what, is, what drought's like. And we have been in those days where it'd be chance of rain, you know? And the skies get cloudy and a little dark and you're thinking, oh, it's gonna rain, we need rain, the trees are dying, you know, it's, it, fire is happening everywhere, we need rain, Lord. And all of a sudden, clouds come up and no rain comes out. How disheartening and how disappointing that is. This is what the, the scripture's in. If you're an unfaithful person, if that's not a part of your character and life, then, then you're like clouds without rain. And, you know, the man who boasts of gifts he doesn't give. So we evaluate our faithfulness at this point, you know, uh, uh, on, on the basis of, if I make promises, do I keep them? Well, a parent really has to watch this, don't we, as parents? You know, because when you tell you, can we do this, can we do this, can we do this? Yeah, well, maybe. That's a promise. You just made a promise. You better clarify what you're saying when you say maybe. Possibility's not there. So it's best to say yes or no. Don't give a false hope. And, if, and then later you can restore the hope by saying, we decided we're going to do it. <laughs> The idea here is, is don't make promises you cannot keep. Proverbs 20 says, chapter, uh, verse 25, it's a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later consider your vow. In other words, you make, oh, I'll do that, but then get down to later and you say, I don't know if I can do that or not. But I said I'd do it, but yeah, I didn't know it was going to cost me some money. I didn't know it was going to take this much time. I didn't know it was going to be this much effort, so I don't know if I'm doing it or not. Said, don't make rash commitments and then later consider it. You make, let your yay be yay and your nay be yay. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. You just do what you say you're going to do. If you're a faithful person, then you say, if you say something that settles it, it's a done deal. God's that way. Whatever he says, it's a done deal. Do I make promises that I cannot keep? What kind of promises? Well, consider those. I'll pray for you. Did you? How many times Christians say, oh, I'll pray for you and don't. Or I'll be back later and don't come. Or I'll take care of that, but don't do it. I'm going to fix that, but don't fix it. I probably would say everybody in this room, without any exception, had different points in our life we've come to. And, and, and much of our disappointment has come from the fact that somebody told us they would do something and didn't do it. It was a friend, husband, wife, neighbor, whatever. They just didn't do it. And bitterness can easily set in those kind of things. When, when, when you tell people you're going to do something and don't do it, well, a lot of resentment results from those kind of things in life. So what's he saying? If you're going to be a faithful person, do what you... If you say, I'll do it, then do it. If you say, I'm not going to do it, then don't do it, all right? Just do whatever you say. And the, the fourth point, the fifth point, if you're a faithful person, you, you not only use, but you're developing your gifts. There's a tremendous emphasis in the Bible on spiritual gifts as well as our abilities, all right? That God's given us spiritual gifts and he's also given us natural talents. And if he's given them to me, then I am responsible for them. 1 Peter 4.10 says, every one of you should use the spiritual gift that, God, that you have received from God to serve others faithfully and be an administra to, to administer the grace of God. In other words, you know what spiritual gifts are? Those are those things that God gives us that are miraculous things. God gives you the ability to do something. It's a spiritual gift. Something you're not naturally perhaps even inclined to, but God gave you the ability. You study the scriptures, you see all those gifts that are listed. But God gives each member in the body a gift. But he doesn't give that member that gift to say, hey, I've got a gift. He gives that member the gift. It's, it's literally called a grace gift. Grace is an active verb, not a noun, all right? God does something. God graces you. He, get, he graces your life, gives you this capacity to grace other people. He says, so if you've been graced, grace others. And by the way, if you're safe, you've been graced. So grace others by using your gift that God's given you. If you don't use your gift... You're cheating yourself, you're cheating the body of Christ, and you're cheating God. Well, Brother Joe, you know, I, I just not, I'm, I'm not really good. I don't do the, the spectacular. Just because you don't do the spectacular doesn't excuse you to go off and do nothing. We all have gifts. Faithfulness is based upon, not do I have a spectacular or something, but faithfulness is based on what we do with what God has given me. And what God has given me, he wants to use it. I, I don't know, I watch some of these talent shows on TV, Voice and American Idol, all those. You always hear them talking about crafting their, or their skills and their arts and stuff. Hey, you've been given a gift, you craft it. But you craft it for a blessing. You craft it to use it for other people. If you're a teacher, study, work hard. If you have the gift of service, you find out how you can use that gift of service and, and, and honor the Lord with it. Develop it, whatever it might be. Service to the Lord. Number six, 
You manage your responsibility wisely. Say, what do you mean? We talk about our gifts that God's given me, but I have more than just that. God has given me this, this, this thing called responsibility over what? What we all have. We have time. We have talents. So just mention a little bit. And we have treasure. The Bible uses this word, you are stewards. Another scripture translates as you are managers. In other words, God's put all this in my life and he wants me to manage it. Manage my time, manage my talent. How am I going to use that? And manage my treasure. If all you do is, is say, well, I've got this great skill that God's given me the ability to do or this great natural talent that I can do. And all you do is just use that in the world. And you make a living. Perhaps that's what your focus is around, what you've been given the ability to do. And you just make a living with that. Then you've missed the mark. God wants you to use that in the kingdom as well. Not just to supply your needs, but in the kingdom. So if you had these abilities and talents and skills and blessings, they're for, they're for a reason. For serving and investing and using wisely for the glory of God. If you're with me, say, uh-huh. Uh, beyond that, if you're with me, take an, take, a, take an estimate of where you're at in this. See what God's done in your life. See what God's given your life. And how are you using that? Luke 16 says, if you won't be faithful in handling your worldly wealth, the, the treasure God's given you, he says, how is God going to trust you with the deeper true treasures? The greater treasures are spiritual. The greater blessings are spiritual. The greater blessings are even yet to come beyond this world. I'll be blessed now, but the greater blessings are coming. I'm not going to experience that if I hadn't been faithful what God's given me. If I haven't handled my, my, my worldly wealth in a righteous manner, how am I going to handle the other? I won't get, even get the opportunity. 1 Corinthians, as he goes through this letter we talked about, you know, he gets down around chapter 16 as he's closing out, and he talks to me there again. He says, hey, you take the opportunity every Sunday to put aside a portion of what you've earned that week as an offering to the body. And he goes on to say, and that amount will depend upon how the Lord has blessed you. So what's that mean? It means there's a, there's a percentage basis. I take a percentage of what God's given me and honor the Lord with it. Well, what's the percentage? I really believe the Old Testament gives us a starting point. You know, that we ought to at least give that percentage 10%. I can't do that. What is God asking you to do? God gives you a whole dollar. He says, give me 10 cents back. You can't give a dime of a dollar. Then you're either a terrible manager of what God has blessed you with. You're not learning how to use responsibly and manage responsibly and wisely. You're either a terrible manager or you're just greedy. More, 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 anymore. I can't have more. I can't live without that dime. I need that dime. I need that dime. I made three dollars, I give thirty cents. I made three hundred dollars, I give what? Thirty dollars. It's still just a dime on a dollar. No matter if it gets up, I made a hundred thousand dollars a year. It's still just a dime on a dollar. You tight wad. You cheapskate. Amen. I mean, think about that from a, a dime on a dollar. I can't give a dime on a dollar. Well, I am tight. But I don't believe it even stops there. I think we're developing. I, I think we should go further. I think we should, the, the more we honor the Lord with, uh, I mean, if the Bible's true, doesn't it say you give and you get? The more you get, the more you get. All right? The less you get, the less you get. Pretty simple principles all through the scriptures. But I believe it's in, in our time as well as our treasure. I believe it's in our talents. God's blessed you with some great, some of you are losing your skill set. Because you buried it. Because you're not using it in the kingdom. Oh, you use it in the world. But you're not using what God gave you in, in the kingdom of God. And it's interesting that if you study the scripture long enough, I believe you'll find our principle is true. If you can't use the material things God's given you faithfully and honor him with them, then that's the acid test of your faithfulness. You failed in all the other areas. If we're not faithful in handling the worldly things, who's going to trust us with true riches, Jesus? Let me ask you this. Do you pay your bills on time? Some of you don't. You're not being faithful. Well, I just have too many bills and not enough income. Then you're living outside your means. Make some adjustments. Show some discipline. But my neighbors live out. Yeah, don't worry about your neighbors. You have to stand before the Lord. And what, what, what are you doing with it? Well, I don't make enough. Get a different job. We can make some more money. Ask God for that. It's amazing if we just like get God involved in the process, what God will do in our life if we let him. But understand this. Bottom line, the Bible says we're going to give an account for these things. Some of you are going to be standing in line. Here's the judgment seat. And you're about three guys back from the guy in front of you, right? Here's the judgment seat. Boy, you're in line. 
that the moment's coming and you're sitting there. I hope this is what some of you are thinking. Praise God for Brother Joe. You're seeing what's going on out in front of you and you're seeing what's happening with the tri trial by fire and you're saying, thank God for my lift leader. Thank God for my Bible study teacher. They taught me the truth about being faithful with these things. I'm not going to sweat this. I was teachable. Hallelujah. You're going to be thanking God for sure then. You'll be looking, where's Brother Jew? I'm going to say hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to pat him on the back and say, thank you, brother. All that time I grabbed about it, thank you, for, thank you for just being honest. We just learn to be responsible. The seventh and eighth, the precept, well, number seven, you obey God's, God's word. That's how all the rest of this works, by the way. In, in 1 Samuel 2, 2, verses 35, it says, God said, I will, I will raise up a faithful priest to serve me and do what I tell him. That's what God's looking for, some faithful people and some faithful priests. If you want to look at that verse later, just circle that point and say, who will do whatever I tell him. God's definition, you know, faithfulness is, to us as believers is obedience to the word of God. I don't pick and choose. I say, yes, sir, Lord, what do you want in these different times? God's going to look at my life and just, you're going to be, was I, was I committed to the word of God? I, therefore, I have to read the word of God. They have to meditate on the word of God. They have to believe the word of God. I have to obey the word of God. But in context of that is number eight. I pass on. It goes out of me. Some of you have been sitting in your lift group for a long time. You've been getting a lot of stuff put in you. Now it's time to go share that with somebody else. Some of you, it's time for you to become lift group leaders. You've been sitting soaking up this stuff. You're starting to look like a wet sponge. You know? It's time to start. It's time to venture out and say, I'm going to start discipling some people. I'm going to start being used by God. I'm going to quit looking for excuses. I want God to do something in my life. It's just this point that I'm... I'm going to put into somebody else's life. This is what we do as parents, isn't it? But then it also applies to our spiritual life. If God teaches me a spiritual truth, you know, I can take that truth and do several things. I can just ignore it. I can apply it to my life. But there's this other element. I can pass it on to somebody else. And if you study scriptures carefully enough, you realize it's your duty to pass on to others what God has given you. Your family, those in ministry, your church, you know. To you, I, I can share it out in the world around me. Go back to 1 Corinthians 4, 2, where it says, hey, it's required of those who've been given a trust to prove faithful. God's given you a family, you better be faithful. God's given you children, you be a faithful parent. God's given you parents, be a faithful child. God's given you a church, be a faithful church man. God gives you a ministry in that church, be faithful to that ministry. I, you have to ask yourself once more, well, what would be the, if I'm faithful at ministry, what, what's the test? I mean, I believe fruit is the, is the result of being faithful. We see God do things. We see God move. We see God work. Not only in our lives, but other people's lives. Now, as I walked out of church at the other campus this morning, someone said, thanks for murdering me this morning. <laughs> and I just shared the next, the truth I'm going to share, I just shared with them. They didn't get it. Here it is. I don't write these things to shame you. But to admonish you as my beloved children. I mean, if you read, this, this gets, you know, he's already in chapter 4 by, you know, just getting in the first fourth of this letter in chapter 4. There's 16 chapters. And he's been tough already. I mean, how would you like to, Paul to stand in front and say, you bunch of babies. That's what he basically said. You're a bunch of babies. Yeah. He said, I have, been, I have given you the basic essentials of what you need to grow in Christ, and you had not grown a lick. You're still, you're acting like lost people. I mean, that's the common vernacular, is it not? You're acting like people don't know Jesus. You, you are such babies. And unfortunately, some of you are. Some of you are still babies. And you've been saved a hundred years. Long time. You ought to be teaching others. You ought to be ministering to people. You ought to be winning people to Christ. You ought to be bringing people to church. You're just sitting around in dirty diapers. Amen. Amen. God gives us the word. Why? So we'll grow, so we'll be admonished, so we'll be encouraged. If you walk in here and say, Brother Joe beat me up, you miss the concept. All right? Understand the levity of it and the funniness of it. But in reality, hey, it's there for an admonition. If you follow this letter through all the way to the end, he talks about humility. He talks about servanthood. He talks about being filled with the Spirit, using the gifts of the Spirit, serving the body of Christ, being a plugged in into some place where you make a difference in people's lives. I, I, Brother Tim came to me this week and told me he'd heard a quote. He said, I was listening to the radio on the way to work this morning. I got this quote, but you can't say it. 
Yeah, you know, that's a challenge to start with. But I thought it might be best for somebody else to say it, because I would say it, especially if Kathy's not in the service. She's out there at the campus with the deal they're doing this morning. So I thought the best thing to do is let me, you got that plugged in back there, to play this quote from Dr. Evans. Now, evidently, Urban. some have not discovered yet that there is a job to do here. The work of service. Many Christians have the idea, I come to church, sing to me, preach to me, counsel me, encourage me, give me money from the deacon's fund. Me, 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 me. Do it for me. Well, in the Bible, that's not a church member. That's a better name for that. Pimp. That's what pimps do. They want all the benefit. They don't do none of the work. That's a leech. That is a person who does not understand. God did not save you to sit, soak, and sour. He saved you for the work of service. That's why we require every member to have a ministry because there is a job God wants you to do. It is a job internally to the church and then externally to the world using your gift. You thought I was hard. <laughs> Sit under that first Sunday, amen. <laughs> I have yet to call anybody a pimp. Or a leech. I need to call you a baby, all right, in dirty diapers. But you understand what I'm talking about this morning. And there's some of you who've been kind of sitting in that form, in that fashion. It's all right, maybe, for a little while when you come in here to kind of learn to navigate what God's doing in Believer's Fellowship. But after a while, you need to be plugging in. You need to be serving. You need to be helping. You say, what can I do? You can do a million things for the body of Christ. Remember those, those questions again that we ask at the beginning of every service? You know, there's some steps that some of you could take, just making yourself available for the kingdom of God. And even if you have a ministry, there's so many other things we can all be doing. All right? There's so many areas of service that we can invest something into somebody's life that is going to make an eternal change. There's always the needs in thousands of places for us to plug in. And be, some of you, you know, there, there's needs that are represented here that are very simple today. There is a need for some of you to help us in some areas like in children and nursery where it would maybe just take one and a half hours every six or eight weeks. One, that's less than a dime on the dollar. <laughs> Percentage wise. Well, I had my kids. You better be glad somebody was in there to help train them and raise them. But what about your grandchildren? What about your friend's grandchildren? Some of you, you know, you've just, you just kind of took a resignation. There's no place for resignation in the kingdom of God. If I quit one ministry, that means I found another one to start in. I have about six, maybe uh, seven of you, five, six of you. I, I found that just last week. We're going to be leaving Awanas. That is good and fine if you're plugging in from Awanas. Where are you going? Well, I don't go nowhere. That's the truth. You're not going nowhere. <laughs> Where are you supposed to serve? And by the way, for those of you who are in Awanas, I can't thank you enough. What you've done, I mean, some of you have been there for years serving the Lord. But when you step out, if you're moving out of that area of ministry, make sure you've got somebody else plugged in. Don't just walk up and say, oh, I'm quit. I'm stopping next year, this year. Find somebody, train them, develop their ministry. To, and that's in music, that's in, that's in teaching, that's in lift groups, whatever it is. Find somebody you've invested in. Help them move into that place. And then you go serve wherever the Lord's leading you. We let everybody know, whatever your ministry is at Believer's Fellowship, we just ask that one-year commitment out of it. All right, do it for a year. At the end of the year, you, you, you find someplace else to serve the Lord. But nobody comes in here to sit on their blessed assurance. <laughs> Amen? So whether it's children's church, whether it's the nursery, maintenance of the facilities here, we shouldn't have to hire somebody every time something needs to be fixed. We got so much talent in this room that can do so many different things. Why should we ever have to pick up the phone to call a serviceman? I mean, some of you guys are, are so skilled and have such abilities in so many areas, your name needs to be on a list. It says, call me if this breaks. I'll be there. Some of you are. I mean, that's the way we've gotten this far, amen? So I, I definitely don't want to make you think there's, there's not a ton of folks in this room that, that aren't serving. There's a ton of folks that are serving God, but there's a whole much more that need to get, get involved. 
Well, I'm tired of this area. Go not weary in well doing. In due season, you're going to reap. You say, well, I haven't been reaping. He will. Wait. But don't give up before the finish line. <laughs> don't stop. Listen, folks, I don't plan on retirement. I really don't. You're going to have to fire me to get rid of me. You know? I plan on preaching to the day I die right here. Make you tote, tote my dead carcass out of here. <laughs> Amen. I really do. I pray God gives me the, the health to do that until he takes me home. Amen. You know, Pastor, me, me, me remember Evangelist Mickey Bonner. And yeah, that's, that's, that's the ideal way as a pastor to go. He, he's standing for 2,000 people preaching, says his last amen, drops dead. Kind of get my point? <laughs> and, and, but what happened, it said his last amen to that sermon, God said, okay, let's come home. He just ushered him right out. Body fell, but he was gone. This is where we, we, we get into the joy part of our Christian walk in life. You know, it, and so many people are playing. We don't have baptism. Nobody gets in the baptism without somebody helping, serving, ministering. Nobody goes in the nursery without somebody caring. You know, somebody goes to children's without people who love your kids and want to disciple them and minister to them. Nobody goes into the lift group without having somebody there in place to instruct and to teach and to care and pray with them and, and encourage them in their ministry and life. Nobody, you don't send your teenagers back upstairs to the, to the youth room on Sunday nights. Somebody's there overseeing and caring and loving and committing and sacrificing, taking Saturdays they could be doing something else and uh, you know, washing cars in a parking lot so they can go on mission trip. I mean, there's just people that make things happen. And so many of us have been blessed in so many ways, but we're not using what God's given us. And we're letting somebody else steal all the blessings. You know? I remember as a kid, there were six of us sitting around the table. Hey, if you wanted a glass of milk, the milkman came once a week and he only dropped two gallons. And if those two gallons were gone the first day, I'm the youngest boy. I had to fight to get me a glass of milk. <laughs> You know what came after milk? Powdered milk. If you ever tasted powder, we were poor. We didn't know it, but we were poor. You ever drank powdered milk? My mama, bless her heart, she's not female today, she's not here, but praise God. You know what she, she would do? At least she had enough sense. She'd take what was called Starlack. Anybody remember Starlack? Somebody, see, there were a few poor people here, amen? Powdered milk, Starlack, and she would mix it with the real milk. That's as nasty as the Starlack was. But anyway, you know. There's places that we can be doing something for. Don't let everybody else get the milk or the meat. You know, you're going to grow in grace by using what God's given. You don't grow. The only way you grow by just hearing the word of God, the Apostle Paul says just hot air, you puff up. You ever had sopapillas? You know what sopapillas are? They just take an old flour tortilla and throw it in hot grease. And what happens? It fills up with hot air. I thought, we got a lot of sopapilla Christians. <laughs> And they got a lot of honey and sugar on them. They're just sweet and, you know, fun to be around. But they ain't good for nothing. They're going to ruin your health eating enough of them. <laughs> Amen. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you, by the way. I'm not going to give an invitation this morning the way you would like to see the invitation. But I'm going to challenge you as we close today. And I'm just going to give you what, I, what I'm going to call the 90-day challenge. Now, tomorrow is what? First of we don't have 31 days. So tomorrow's the 1st. April 1st, May 1st, July. Okay, when we get to July 1st, it'll be 90 days. All right? On July 1st, is it? Are you shaking your head this way? Is this the way? May, April, May, June. All right, that's 90 days. There's 31 days this month? Is that why you're shaking your head this way? Okay. Bear with me. You act, quit acting like Kathy. <laughs> that's my wife, for those who don't know. Okay. She just says she's helping me. All right, I know you're helping me. But 90 days from now, from today, just whatever you got, take your iPhone, your iPad, your smartphone, your calendar, whatever. You're, you know, if you're Tim Strickland, use that little pad he likes to write on. And, and just mark that whatever 90 days is. And look at, look at three areas of your life. And in 90 days, invest in, and, and, and commit to these 90 days. And you know how fast time is. Mean, who, who believed? I mean, just yesterday was January 1st, it seems like. It'll, it'll go fast. But 90 days, look where you are in these particular areas about going higher. Where am I in my treasure? Where am I in my time? And where am I in my talents? In fact, the Bible says, in regard to your treasure, the Lord says, you trust me in this. If you begin to tithe, he says, try me in this. 
It's like a dare. God says, just test me and try me. Now, the best way to test and try something is to take notes. Ask any scientist, right? Did this work? What did we do? What were the applications? Did it work? And then what's the results? So see where you are now. So well, I'm giving a little bit. I'm giving a little bit. Or I'm giving 10%. All right? Well, just up at one, two, three, four percent, something like that. You know, just see, and, and do this with your time. I mean, be honest. How much time do you spend a day with the Lord? Just in a quiet time, in prayer time. Oh, well, I just pray all the time, Brother Joe. Okay, so you don't. Okay. <laughs> if you do, whether it's five minutes, say I'll get up in the morning, I'll spend a little time with the Lord, or in the evening, five, 10, 15, whatever, just, just, just increase it, a percentage. Tick five, stick five more minutes, 10 more minutes on there. Just get up earlier for Jesus. You can do that. I mean, it's the Lord. He died for you. You can get up early. Take a, and, and just see where you are in, in context of your time. And the abilities that God's given you, your gifts that God's given you, your time, your talents, your treasures, you, each one of these areas, just catalog them. Do a little journaling for 90 days. I, I told Kathy the other day, you know, I wish I'd journaled a whole lot more. Of just where we were, what God did, what we were expecting, what the brokenness time was, the difficult time, and how God answered. To be able to leave that with my grandkids. There's a lot of stuff I'm starting to write down. Because I want my grandkids to see something. I want my, we always made an important fact of telling, every time we saw God do something supernatural in our, in our lives, when our children were little, we wanted them to see what God could do. Here's where we are. Daddy, can I have this? Well, let's pray about it. And let's, let's start being specific in our prayer about it. I mean, I didn't buy my kids their first bicycle. I made them pray for it and asked God to give it to them. I mean, my daughter wanted a particular doll when she was about four or five years old, you know. And it not been a tightwad. I could have gone out and bought it. I said, let's pray about that. Let's see if the Lord wants. And if the Lord tells me to do it, I'll do it. But if he doesn't, let's see who puts it on his heart. We started praying about this doll. She wanted that doll. So we started, oh, Jesus, I ask you, can I have such a doll? Please, in Jesus' name, as you will. You know, about, about 20, 30 days later, some, we, were, we were in a meeting somewhere, and I was preaching. I had my family with me. And this lady just brought this bag in to, to my daughter. She didn't know anything about our prayer. She said, the Lord, just lay my heart to give us this, buy this doll for your daughter. Woohoo! <laughs> Swing set, same way. I mean, what happens? They learn then to trust the Lord and ask God and see what God can do, what God does. It, it's, it's starting. So just do a little, just do a little journaling is all I'm asking. 90 days from now, look at your life over the next few days. You know, I'm giving this much right now, and here's what's happening in my life, and here's my checkbook balance, and, and when, when the blessings start coming in, write down the blessing. If it's a blessing in your time, there's a lot of people who say, I don't have time to serve the Lord. It's because you don't invest your time. You don't use it responsibly. You don't manage it. You know what? Well, you've got more time. That's the dumbest thing you could ever tell anybody. Everybody gets the same amount of time. If you can get more, tell me where. You know, just I'll go get us all some. All right, I'll pay for it. Okay. Now you want us more time to invest some time. Where are you serving the Lord? So well, just right now, you know, I'm not involved in any ministry. But today, I'm going to commit to be involved with the children's ministry. I'm working VBS. I can, I can get some time. I can get, there's a week there that I can really make a difference in children's life. I'm going to get involved in vacation Bible school. I'm going to get involved in evangelism and explosion. I'm going to get involved in, in my lift group. I just I didn't have time. I don't, what are you doing? You're watching basketball on TV. There's nothing redemptive at all about that. You know, I don't want to stand before the judgment and say, uh, how was that March Madness there in 2014, Arms? See, your brackets don't look too good. You don't want to hear that. It doesn't make any difference in the world. Well, I can do something that makes a difference in somebody's life. So here's the invitation today. Somebody open those side doors for me, would you? I'm going to let you escape out the side doors today. Run while you can. All of us can do something. And, you know, Tim, apologize to your mom this morning for me. Because I was going to, I had her written in my notes. I was going to mention her in the sermon over there when she was there, and I didn't. Val, how old is your mom? Now, we didn't tell what her age was. Y'all didn't hear that. All right, 84. She's on a walker. She has difficulty getting around. She has all kinds of health issues. You know, she, she is, when you get those nice birthday cards from the pastors with our students, she's the one who takes the envelopes, gets the cards, addresses the envelopes, puts everything together, brings them to us to sign. We have people that show up here that support our office staff. They come in, they, they help with the newsletters. They fold them, they sort them, all the stuff that needs to be done with them, get them ready for mailing. There's always something everybody can do. All of us. So I want to encourage you. And you say, well, I'm doing a ministry, but you can still help in some of these other areas. Take an hour every six or eight weeks to participate. Now, my want to workers, I, I picked on you a little bit. You know I love you, and I can't tell you how, how grateful I am for the service you've done but really make sure, it, it may do well for you to kind of 
say, hey, I'll leave this year, you leave next year, and you leave next year. You kind of elevate yourself out to make sure that these areas are covered in ministry because to be faithful to that. You know, if I step out of the pulpit here and the Lord does come when it comes to the issues of health or whatever, I want to do everything I can to make sure that whatever happens here next is taken care of properly. And that's, you know, we have spent the last years, especially in those who are in the inner circle like Mike and others and Tim, of developing the deacons ministry, the elders ministry, everything we can to be in place so that no matter, whatever catastrophic event might happen, if all the staff's on a mission trip somewhere and gets killed, the church is still stable. Amen. You know, investing everything to everybody we can, deepening everybody we can. So we have a good solid rock that no matter what, I've seen, you've seen it, too many churches when the pastor goes or something happens, everybody's church just falls apart. That's not believer's fellowship. Amen. Amen. So, do what needs to be done within the context of the ministry that God called you to be faithful to, to do it. And then be a part of whatever ministry God would lead you to be a part of it. But let's all serve Christ. Let's all enjoy this journey together. And let's all, when we're standing there at the bema seat, you know, we're not all sweating beads, you know. <laughs> and we know that, hey, I didn't do the, I didn't, I didn't preach in the biggest church. I didn't preach to the biggest crowds. But God didn't call me to preach in the biggest church. God didn't call me to preach to the biggest crowd. God called me to be faithful. I'm responsible for the depth of this ministry and for the height of it. God's responsible for what happens on the breadth of it. Same in your life. Just be faithful what you know God's called you to do. I think we ought to have volunteer lists in every area of ministry so it's just mind-blowing. Brother, we, we have the ministry tables. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. Back here, when you exit the building today, if you're a member, all right, there are different tables, and you'll see the signs up for children's ministry, VBS, uh, uh, office assistance ministries. It's not every ministry. It's just churches where you need some volunteers, some help set right now. You'll see some of maybe the food and clothing, some of those areas are back there. I don't know all the ones that got set up back there, but I know there's some areas and there's some needs back there. I would encourage you to go back there, whatever the Lord may be touching your heart with. Look around the room. Walk over there. There'll be people behind this table to answer any questions you have. Well, what's involved? If I, come, if I sign up for children's church, you know, to help out up there, what's involved? If I sign up for the, uh, for the minute, and there's some areas where we, we need more consistent work, and it's like an every week kind of thing uh, in, in the nursery as well as the children's church ministry, you know? That's what we have on the fifth Sunday, everybody comes into service together. You know, people say, well, you know, that so-and-so needs to be down here. Hey, so-and-so needs to be serving. More than anything else, we need to be finding a place to serve. So-and-so can get ministered to on his lift group. So-and-so can get ministered to in the worship service on Sunday, last Sunday of the month. Hey, you know, if, if you're like me, who ministers to me? I make sure I get plenty of ministry. I read books. I listen to Dr. Evans. I listen to all kinds of people. I'm always getting stuff and trying to keep fresh at what I'm sharing with you. Be responsible over it. So we can serve the Lord. Anybody here ready to retire? Means you're ready to die. Amen. Just where am I going to serve God at? Get in on it. The best days are ahead of us. God's doing some things in this community we better be ready for, or God will walk right by us, find somebody that is. I don't want that, do you? Let's stand together.